I guess we can start now. All right, Preeti ji, please. Preeti ji. Arvinda ji, aap shuru karein. All right. Aaj thi is itihasik sham de vich Maja House de is ऑनलाइन प्लेटफॉर्म इस वेड़े दिन तो हड़ा सारे अंदर स्वागत अप्रैल दे विच सारे बहुत सारे प्रोग्राम्स पिछले एक अप्रैल तो शुरू हुए ने थे अप्रैल पूरा महीना इस सारा चलेगा ऐसी ऐसे बहुत सारी यह पुरानी यह यादानु ताजा करेंगे आज भी वो हिस्टोरिकल डे है जिन यह कुछ हासियां कुछ खुशियां यह पर ना � कुछ एहो जी हैं यादा ने जिन्हें हैं याद कर दिया अखान नाम हो जान दिया ने जिसे ऐसी हार्वेस्टिंग नो कनेक्ट दी कटाई नो और पूरे साल दे रोजगार नो आज दे दिन तो सेलिब्रेट कर दिया वैसाखी दे नाल जिसे खालसा पंथ दी स्थापना हुई 1699 दे विच गुरु गोविंद सिंह जी दे हथो एक नमी रूफ उकन वास पर इधर नाल नाल कुछ एहो दिया यादा भी ने आज दे दिन जुड़ियां जड़ियां हिस्टोरिकल ने इतिहासिक ने और सदा हिस्टोरिकल रहन गया जिन्हें दे बेचो एक हॉलोकॉस एक बहुत बड़ा मैसेज है जिन्हें मैं कहूँ के अमृतसर दी ए सर्दी से आज दे दिन हुआ 1919 दे बेच जब मैं गलत नहीं थे शायद वो हिंदुस्� जिसने पूरे हिंदुस्तान को मजमा तो ऊपर उठके इकट्ठा काम करने दी एक रोशनाई दी थी। 13 अप्रैल 1919 जब तो जनरल डायर माइकल और वायर दे हुक्मानु लेके अमृतसर दी ए स्तरती से अन्य वाग गोलियां चलाना होया 1500 वाद गोलियां चलाके 400 वाद लोगानु कत्ले आम करके कत्तो गारत करके और हजार तो बाद लोगों ने जख्मी करके ये हो जिया अमित ये हो जिया दुखदाई यादा सारे सारे अन्य छट गया कि आज भी उन्हें यादा ने याद कर दे हुए लू कंडे रोंगटे खड़े होंगे नहीं तो अखान नाम हो जाने आने माजा हाउसा हमेशा ही उपराला और ये उपराले दे विच आज सारे ना एक बहुत ही नामवर हस्ती uh, the Maja House, Preeti Gill, I would request Preeti Ji to introduce the guest speaker of today's evening. Or in a yada de which jithe baki saran yane, meriam personal vine, mere grandfather, survivor son, was massacred. They mani yada, kesade tin vaje jado unanum hoshai, ta una de pele lafasan ke mez and daha, ya make se kese hor dunia to, to anu saranu de kya. So over to Preeti Ji. Thank you, Amindaji. Good evening, everyone, and greetings on the 13th of April, Vesakhi, from Maja House to each one of you who has joined us this evening. Today, we have a special talk by Anita Anand, political journalist and presenter of Any Answers on BBC Radio 4. Anita has been a BBC broadcaster for 12 plus years, and her television credits include Newsnight, and the daily politics on BBC Two, and the Sunday politics and the Heaven and Earth show. She has also guest presented Beyond Westminster, the Westminster Hour, Women's Hour, and Saturday Life. Her books include Sophie, Princess Suffragette Revolutionary, Kohinoor, the story of the world's most infamous diamond, and what she's going to talk to us about today, her book on Udham Singh. Uh, the new title of which is The Revenge of Jallianwala Bagh. Her book features Baisakhi, Jallianwala Bagh, Udham Singh, and Amritsar, 
all of which make it important for us at Maja House, based as we are in Amritsar. On the 13th of April, 2018, just about a month after we had opened um, uh, the literary and cultural space that we call Maja House, we had marked the 99th uh, year of uh, the Jallianwala Bagh incident of the massacre. With the talk on its uh, historical significance, we had poetry and we also had a play uh, performed by a local theater group. Uh, we had conversations with families of those who had lost their uh, lives, lo lost their loved ones uh, in the massacre. And people still remembered, they carried their photographs, they carried drawings, and they had come and talked to us about it at Maja House. Um, we had also uh, a wonderful stirring poet poem read by Professor Behel, uh, which was on the incident. Since then, of course, we have marked the day commemorated, remembered each year. And this time we've got this online session, this talk by a very significant writer, a significant voice, um, Anita Anand. Thank you, Anita, very much uh, for being here today. And um, let me say right now how eagerly I'm waiting to listen to you, to not only about the book, but also your personal memories of your grandfather and uh, you know, what he remembers of the incident. Um, thank you very much also for accepting this uh, invitation to speak to us today. Um, and thank, thank, you. thank you so much. Thank you very, very much indeed. And Sasya to, to all of you today. Um, it is a great privilege to be able to speak to you today. Um, I'm going to start this talk for you uh, a bit differently uh, to the way that I, I do it here in Great Britain, because um, I'm a product of these two countries. I was born in Great Britain, brought up and I work here. Um, but ever since I was a very small girl, my parents thought it was very important for me to understand and know about my Punjabi heritage and about our family history. And this is how I came to be interested in this story and how actually more than that, it's, it's entwined in our family DNA, if you like. Um, I'm going to... Uh, try and share uh, some pictures with you from the book, because normally what I find that I have to do with a British audience is that I have to start by telling them the very basics, because here in this country there is a, there is a deliberate, if I may say, amnesia about things that were done in the colonial past. And before I had written my book and I went on the publicity treadmill, as it were, there were hardly any people who knew about the massacre. They did not know about the name Udham Singh, but they also didn't know about the name Rex Dyer and Michael O'Dwyer. So I'm going to tell you as well a little bit of what I found uh, in this, this journey to, to discover this story. Udham Singh, you probably know a lot more about than the people I've been speaking to over the last year and a half. Um, Rex Dyer is also pivotal in this story. Uh, Indian born, Raj to his very roots. He was educated largely in India, but then sent back to Ireland to finish his education off at a place called Middleton College. And he hated every minute of being back in Britain. To him, that wasn't home, India was his home. And Sir Michael, who is pivotal to the dreadful bloodshed that went on on Vesakhi Day in 1919, but so much of the terror and bloodshed, bloodshed that followed. This is a man who was born in 1864. He was an Irish Catholic. He was born in a place called Tipperary in Ireland and surrounded by Irish Catholic families. That area, for those of you who don't know, is one that is marked by anti-British, anti-colonial sentiment. The people that he grew up around hated British rule every bit as much as so many of the revolutionaries we honor today from India because they wanted to have freedom, self-determination, and they resented having to pay taxes without having any say in where the money went. But Sir Michael's family were different. Sir Michael's family believed that the nationalists brought upheaval. They were hotheads, they were thugs. And as a result, they were an unpopular family in their area. Sir Michael went on to serve in the I Indian Civil Service. Now, 
that is a cadre of some 1200 people who controlled all of India and they were weaned on this milk that the native Indians were not to be trusted that after 1857 and the mutiny, you could never turn your back on an Indian. And that is the, the mentality that he went into his service with. He had a family that were alienated from the nationalists around them. Indeed, his house was fired upon by, by Irish nationalists and his father um, who escaped the bullets, nevertheless suffered a terrible and fatal stroke after that. So, so Michael always believed that nationalism was equated with chaos, violence, disorder, and evil, to put it in those binary ways. When he arrived in India in 1885, he loved India, but he didn't love the Indians. He loved the way in which the pith helmet British could live their life in luxury. He loved that Indians knew their place as long as Indians knew their place. He would classify the Indians that he saw. He saw them as a as an almost troublesome backdrop to the kind of job and work that he had to do. So if you look at his book, India as I knew it, you'll see that he, he categorizes Indians almost like a botanist studying poisonous species. So the Sikhs were brave, fiery, but not none too intelligent. The Beals were big drinkers. Uh, the Hindu Brahmins were soft bodied and treacherous. If anything happened that caused Indians pain, he often thought that it was down to some lack of racial quality in Indians. So famine, for example, was, was their fault, not the British who uh, were governing at these times. There was one type of Indian that he reserved the most hatred for, the educated Indian, the soft-bodied Brahmin, if you like, and this one in particular, um, who I always have to explain to a British audience who this is because they know Gandhi and the loincloth. They don't know Gandhi, the lawyer who first came over from South Africa, uh, called over to try and build up the spirit of a resistance to British rule. It was during the Darbar celebrations of 1912 that Sir Michael was given the nod that he would be in control of Punjab as the Lieutenant Governor. And he was warned at the same time by uh, the Viceroy that he would have to face a place that was bubbling with ill feeling towards the British, that this was one of the most troublesome provinces to control, that people here were wild, that they uh, were ungovernable, unbiddable, and therefore he would have to rule with an iron fist. So just imagine, this is a man who's going in already with preconceptions of distrust and violent distrust, in fact, and then these things are built upon when he's given the job. This, by the way, is one of the um, finest finds when I was doing the research for this, this book, which took a, a few years. If you look in the back row of the people there, behind the little girl with the long hair, that is Sir Michael peeping out behind his family and friends with his pet leopard. Uh, I just find this really amusing because like the leopard, uh, he too tried to, to muzzle uh, India and Punjab in particular, because he thought actually it was only through brute force that you could quell any sort of resistance. At the outbreak of World War I, he had always proclaimed that uh, Punjab uh, was the sword hand of India, and he boasted about sending the most number of troops to fight in the war. Now, there are bits I'm going to skip over, but I have to explain in more detail to British audiences about how much blood and coin Punjab spilt during the war, how when the soldiers came back, they expect to be rewarded for their service and how instead with the ongoing Rowell attack ex act extension, they were instead faced with even greater oppression. And with these calls for greater freedom, how did Sir Michael react? He reacted with crackdown after crackdown, rounding thousands of people up in, uh, in Punjab, putting them in these camps uh, and brooking absolutely no criticism whatsoever. He came down hard against local publications that questioned his, his actions and questioned whether this was due payback to people who had sacrificed so much in Britain's name. Now we come to Amritsar. Amritsar, the city there that you sit in, the city that means so much to Sikhs all over the world. And it was in Amritsar that Michael O'Dwyer felt that he would have to make his final stand against the resistance that was building up. Now, you all know probably that he managed to head off a, a, a visit by Gandhi. Um, three days ago, it would have been that Gandhi was traveling to um, Punjab 
to speak at the invitation of Satyabal and Kichilu. And instead of allowing him to come and perhaps pass off in a peaceful uh, manner, he instead dispatches this man, his iron fist, Rex Dyer. Now, Rex Dyer didn't know Amritsar. He hadn't been based in Amritsar, but he turns up. And let's just talk about the day that we are today marking. Vesaki, yes, a time when tens of thousands of people had poured into this great city, not for political reasons mainly, um, but because this was a time to give thanks. The harvest was in, it's Vesaki, you give thanks at the Golden Temple and you come into Amritsar, a lot of people to do business. This is a thriving day. The cattle fair should have been on, a horse fair should have been on that day. And Dyer, as you know, drives his armored column of men to the walled garden in Amritsar, tells them to spread out on the raised bank and without any warning at all, orders them to fire on 20,000 civilians, unarmed civilians who are gathered in the garden. Some there, yes, to hear the political speeches that are going on, but others who are there just to sit and catch up and to chat just as they always have done in this flat space in Amritsar. And he orders them to fire and to fire and to fire and to fire 1650 shots again reload fire again reload fire no chance to escape and even worse he orders his men to fire into the thickest parts of the crowd where people are running and screaming and trying to get away now um while we were chatting before and in the introduction you heard a fine gentleman talk about his grandfather who was there in the garden on the day of the massacre. My grandfather, this man here, Lala Ishwar Das Anand, was also in the garden that day, a teenager gangling and without much experience of the big city of Amritsar. He had been born and grown up in Kalabagh and come down to do some sewing machine deals for his father. The first time his father had sent him out, he wanted to make him proud. And he had the I mean, I say good fortune because had it been a different way, perhaps I wouldn't have been here today. But he left the garden, left his friends who he was having a picnic with, told them, keep my food. I'm going to be back. I've just got to go and do something in the market and I'll be right back. And he goes off to Hall Market to do this sewing machine deal. And then the wailing sweeps over the market and he knows something is very, very wrong. And I never got a chance to meet my grandfather, Lala Ishwadas Anand, but my, my father has told me the story of how he tried to get back. He couldn't because the soldiers were screaming people off the streets and that instead he ran and he hid, which he always felt eternal shame for because the next morning after that horror of a night where people were just left to bleed to death in the dirt, where Dyer sent no medical aid in nor allowed people to come and drag out their loved ones. He waited till morning to find out the people he was sitting with his friends were dead. Now my, my grandfather went blind at a very young age and um, when people came to sympathize with him, he would say, don't, don't say a thing to me don't give me any sympathy. God granted me that my life that day is only right that he takes the light from my eyes or takes something. Another young man, a similar age to my grandfather, is the man who this book is named for, Udham Singh. Now you all know the legend that young Udham Singh was in the garden, trapped that long night. Some say he was hit by a bullet. Others say he was serving water. Um, We'll come to the truth of that or as close as we can get to that in a moment. But he would have been the similar age to my grandfather. And you know how the legend goes that in the morning as the light first hits the earth of that garden and he sees after hearing the screaming turning to whimpering, turning to silence in that long horror of a night, he sees the carnage around him and he scoops up this, this handful of, of blood soaked earth and takes this terrible vow that no longer, no matter how long it takes and no matter where it takes me, I'm gonna find the men who did this and kill them with as little pity as they've shown my people. Udham Singh, by the way, in this photograph that I just showed you had jumped into a frame. Uh, this is a photo taken in Sunam, which is the place where his, uh, his family had found their roots. And he just jumped into this photograph at the last minute. Um, because he said that 
he was destined for great things and his image ought to be captured for posterity. So this is a man who wanted to be something and be somebody. We'll come back to him in, in just a moment. But let's just talk about the, the massacre. People talk about it these days as if it was a thing that happened in isolation, the one great horror of colonial rule in Punjab. But let's not forget the crawling order where Dyer asked people to wriggle in the dirt and lick the boots of his soldiers in the days that followed. Let's not forget that Sir Michael ordered gallows to be erected around the city so that people could see them, not just here in Amritsar, but also Lahore and in other places in Punjab, so that people could see what would happen to those who defied the British Hukumat. Let's talk about the whipping posts that were erected, where people were flogged within sight of their neighbours. No trial, no due process, often no charges ever laid and people were let go at the end. But this was all to build the terror that, that would help him to keep control of these restive people in the north. And let's talk about the strafing from the sky that took place around Gujranwala, where a man called Carberry was told to fly a fighter plane over and, and shoot at anybody on the roads. And he was so high up, he couldn't see whether he was firing at men, women or children, but he fired nonetheless. And when they fled for their lives, and tried to get away, he fired into their homes, not knowing if there are cradles with sleeping babies underneath those roofs, but firing nonetheless. Now, Udham Singh certainly knew about all of these things, and it filled him with a hatred of the British that couldn't be quelled. Speaking to uh, people in Sunam and, and coming across some notebooks of somebody who knew him very well, and they're sort of you can, as close as you can get to contem contemporaneous records at the time, he burned with fury about the British. He wanted them to pay for what they had done, not just for Jallianwalabad, but for all the subsequent horrors that happened afterwards. But what was he to do? This is a man who has no agency, no wealth, no family connections, an orphan who is of Cambodge caste, who has nobody to fall back on, very little education, and no means to carry out this big vow that he has carried out. So what does he do? Well, he tries to throw himself in with the, um, the, the revolutionaries who are around him, but they don't take him seriously because he has nothing to offer. He's a pretty much a bad boy, a leafleteer for them. He's running out of money. He's running out of food. He needs to sustain himself. So he follows this slipstream that many did in those days and goes off to Africa to work on what is now known as the lunatic line. They called it the lunatic line because you had to be mad to work on it. You were paid a pittance. You often had to sign up for a, a period of time, maybe a year, given a loan to get out there, which it was very hard to pay back ever. And you were uh, either attacked by disease, the sun, or even lions. I mean, these are some of the pictures. There were two uh, very famous lions who picked off many of the Indian workers working on this line. And while Udham Singh was out here in Africa, he meets other anti-colonialists who hate the British as much as he does. And they are the ones who tell him, look, go, go and get some more education, go and get some training. You need to go and learn from the gathers. And again, I don't, it's, it's a quite a, a joy to be able to talk to a, an audience such as yourselves, because I spend quite a lot of time here in Britain explaining about the Gather Brotherhood, but you probably know all about this already. And so Udham does, he, he goes from Africa and he goes to America where he hopes to be taken under the wing of somebody and made into a man who can do the things that he wants to do. He's a man who wants to be someone, yes. A lot is written about what his, what his personality is like. Some of that, by the way, has been a, a project by the British after what happens in 1940 to discredit him and his motives and his political um, determination. But there is some truth in this, that Udham was a man who wanted to be more than he was born to be. So in America, he sort of starts following what we now know as the, the American dream. He starts to get work. He starts to make connections with, with the Gather Brotherhood, yes, but by also through them with other Indians who are making their lives in America, who are managing to make money, get homes. He works 
on the factory lines on cars. He tries to get work in an airplane factory. He learns skills. He has money jangling in his pocket. These things are important, but more importantly than that, he learns to walk with a straight back. He learns to dress like a Westerner, to meld in a crowd. He can mix with those who are uh, Western as well as those who are Indian. He often passes as being a Mexican, for example. Um, this is where he learns to become the chameleon that he needs to be. And in 1927, he is given the name Frank Brazil. Um, and that is how, and I, I go through this in much detail in the book, uh, of how he does these, uh, the, the name Frank Brazil is much used and abused by the Gothers to ferry goods and pamphlets and money um, in and out of, of the country. And the Frank Brazils who I found on these many manifests were different men, different people, different weights, different heights. And he was one of the Frank Brazils of them saying. Now he comes back to India. So I've, I've gone a bit too far with my, my slide, but um, he goes back to India for the Gathers as Frank Brazil, carrying money to buy arms. And this is becomes his undoing because Udham Singh does have character flaws, really serious character flaws. In his effort to be somebody, he wants to show people that he is somebody. So when he goes back to America, uh, to India rather, he is staying in Amritsar in the back alleys where prostitutes live to try and keep a low profile while he does these, these arms deals and also brings back banned gather literature to Amritsar. But he decides to wear his smartest Western clothes while he's doing it. So of course he comes to the attention of the local police who pull him in, discover what he's doing and throw him in prison. I should say one very important thing that I, I forgot to tell you, um, but while in America, there is every indication that Udham Singh uh, found love as well as work. He, um, there are records of him uh, falling in love with a woman called Lupe, who I going through combing through the American records I found Lupe Singh um, and he has the chance to have a family, to have love, to have you know, roots and to have the things that most people dream of. And yet he sort of leaves her behind to pursue his, his vow and also his new life as a, as a somebody, as a revolutionary who is going to set India free. While Udham Singh, after being picked up for the gun running uh, is in prison, one of the people he hates with such passion dies, and that is Reginald Dyer. And Reginald Dyer is given something close to, not exactly a state funeral, but something close to a state funeral. This is his uh, cortege being dragged through the streets of London with a full military escort. Um, when Rex Dyer came back from the massacre at Jallianwalabagh, he was given a hero's welcome, as was Michael O'Dwyer. But the two men handled this in very, very different ways. On the one hand, Rex Dyer, after the uh, Hunter inquiry, is a broken man. He is, he is shocked by the accusations that are hurled against him because he truly believes he tried to do the right thing and he was following orders and what he did was necessary. But when he's faced with these allegations that what he did was monstrous, what he did was unnecessary, and he will never be forgiven for it, he withdraws from public life. Michael O'Dwyer, on the other hand, dines out on this. He goes on the lecture circuit and says how he is the man who saved the Raj, how together he and Dyer did exactly what every British person should do when they are in India to show them who is boss and to make sure the empire doesn't slip away through their fingers. So Dyer dies while Udham Singh is in prison. Um, the interesting thing, and there's a side issue, but I, I think it's interesting enough to tell you about, the, the, the family of Rex Dyer tell a story about the eve of his death, that there was a terrible storm. He's been sequestered in the countryside. His wife has taken away him away from the public glare because she wants him to have a quiet end at least. And the electricity is knocked out in their house. And uh, Phyllis, his daughter-in-law, comes to comfort him and says, don't worry, this will pass. This will pass. It'll be fine. And he says, I don't want it to pass. He takes her meaning to be um, that this, this seizure that he's suffering is going to pass. And he says, I don't want it to pass. I want to meet my maker. I want to know whether what I did was right 
or wrong. Um, so right till the end, he is he's filled with doubt. Um, if anyone is interested, I have um, a little anecdote to share with you, if you would like, about meeting a descendant of Reginald Dyer and how that went. Uh, not as you might imagine. Anyway, Dyer is gone. Udham Singh is out now of prison, having served his sentence, and he makes his first try for Britain. Straight after being released, he's under surveillance. He's being followed because he's been released on terrorist charges. And yet he manages to get out on the coattails of a young student who has uh, a permission to study, he thinks, in America. He goes with him, Pritham Singh, to get to Britain and then to go to America. Uh, like everybody who loves Udham Singh, he, he dumps Pritham as soon as Pritham becomes inconvenient. And he carries on trying to establish himself in London, in 1930s London. This is a picture, it's wonderful actually, um, taken of him in the Shepherd's Bush Gurdwara, which happens to be actually where I married my husband in London, uh, where he is he's helping to make the rotis for Lunga. It's a, it's a press association picture. And we're just very lucky to have it by accident. The photographer at the time did not know who he was taking pictures of. He was just taking pictures around the Gurdwara. Uh, while he's in London, Udham Singh, is nowhere near the man who can get close to a man like Michael O'Dwyer, who travels with a chauffeur, who travels with security, who visits the very finest places behind the highest iron gates. And so instead, what he does is he spends his time cultivating contacts. In the book, I have uh, accounts from many different people who thought Udham Singh was their special friend and lived in their house. He had many different addresses that he maintained, not just in London, but in Coventry, in Leeds and other places where people thought he was their boy, that he was their man. He worked as a peddler, but also he was one of the few people who had that kind of belief in himself. He really still wanted to be the somebody who took work as an extra in films by Alexander Corder. Uh, this one, Elephant Boy, is, is much cited as, a, as a, a film that he took a role in. But he is not as clever as he thinks, because having gone through records which were meant to be sealed in perpetuity, which we were never meant to see, I found records of Udham Singh's surveillance by MI5, not just by MI5, but by this man, the very head of M MI5, a man called Vernon Kell, who himself took an interest in Udham Singh's case. And when there were sightings of a man who was boasting in a pub about causing a revolution and running guns to India, Kell takes special interest. But as happens so often, I mean, certainly in, in Britain, people who are on a surveillance list drop through the cracks. And that is what happens to Udham Singh. They lose track of him. Let's go forward now to the day itself. 1940, Britain is at war and Udham has been had to leave in a hurry. He had to leave Southampton. He was trying to get closer and closer to Michael O'Dwyer's holiday home, which was also on the coast, and had got no traction there. But there is this meeting taking place in a, in a hall called Caxton Hall, which is, and there is a dire symmetry to so much of this story, but it's as far away from the House of Commons, Houses of Parliament, as the Golden Temple is from Jelly Malabarg. And in it, the great and the good of the Raj are, are coming together to talk about what must be done, how the East can help in the war effort. There are important people who are going to be here at this meeting. Uh, Michael O'Dwyer is going to be delivering the vote of thanks, a man who has been living his life since coming back to Britain on the lecture circuit, reveling in all that had been done under his rule in Punjab. But also there is going to be this man here, Lord Zetland, who is the Secretary of State for India. Lord Lamington is going to be there. Louis Dane is going to be there. All former luminaries of the Raj in India. We know what happened that day because of these records that have been buried for so long. That Udham Singh, very calm, first of all, Udham Singh manages to get hold of a gun. He manages to get hold of bullets that unfortunately don't fit his gun. In the meantime, in the interim and all this time, and I haven't gone into detail because it would take too long, but while he has been in Britain, he's also been making frequent trips to Eastern Europe, to Russia in particular. And on these 
trips, he has made contacts with people who have funded his lifestyle, but also transformed a man who had a pretty dire record in the First World War as a soldier in Mesopotamia into a crack shot. So on the day of the 13th of March, 1940, Utham Singh, who's learnt to be a chameleon, who's learnt to melt into the crowd, comes into this hall packed to the rafters with British people he, to hear this, this speech by Raj luminaries. And he stands with his back against the panelled wall and he waits and he bides his time. Some of the eyewitness accounts say he sucks a sweet. Only a handful of people notice that there is a, a brown faced man in the hall in their midst. And right at the end, as everybody is getting up to congratulate each other after the speech, after Sir Michael has done his rousing speech of gratitude, Udham Singh walks to the front and extends his hand. Now, to Michael O'Dwyer, it must have felt as if he was yet another person hoping to shake his hand to say, well done, job well done. But instead, Udham Singh opens fire and shoots. The gun that he has used in this, and I um, was very fortunate, I've got a friend who's a ballistics ex expert and, and I have experienced this, has an enormous kick to it. So you fire this weapon and it verily leaps out of your hand and you have to bring it down with great force to level it. But in a matter of a split second, Udham has fired once, lowered his hand once again and fired again in an almost parallel trajectory, shooting a bullet straight through Michael O'Dwyer's heart. And then again, a parallel trajectory to the first bullet. So Michael crumples to the ground and lies dying in a pool of blood in the way that so many lay in pools of their own blood in Jallianwala Bagh. He then fires on the others in the room, those great names that I mentioned before, Zetland, Lamington and Dane. And as the prosecutor puts it, he did not miss once. The prosecutor says every bullet found a billet. This caused a sensation in Britain. This is a country that's already looking to the skies for the start of the blitz, looking at the threat from Nazi Germany pressing on its borders. And here a man has walked in Westminster of all places and opened fire on some of the most important people in the empire. So that is why Udham Singh's story became one that then was manipulated and the forces that came to play, and again, the large part of the, the last bit of the book is all about the way in which the British authorities sought to rob him of any agency in this. Uh, and that's what they did. <laughs> yeah, we all want to know. Never mind. Um, let, me, uh, let me stop there. Uh, let me stop there and come back to you. And if there are any questions at all, please do uh, feel free to ask. And I, I'm very happy to take questions from you. Thank you very much. Uh, could you please unmute yourself? Yeah. Thanks, Anita. That was quite fascinating. It was really a fantastic story. And so much drama, so much action. I'm sorry for that really Not abrupt sure. ending, but please no. tell us more. I think we're all waiting. Like I'm waiting with bated breath. Yeah. It's truly really fabulous telling. Thank you. Okay. And, um, and those photographs, because they just sort of embellish everything that you've been saying. It's really wonderful to see all of that as well. And um, I don't know. I mean, uh, I think each one of us has really enjoyed it. Uh, does anybody have a question or a comment? Would anybody like to um, come up with a comment here? Anybody no, from think, the audience? Then we can. Hello? Arvindaji? Yeah, can, can you hear me now? Yes. Maybe you should take the, yeah, take that off. Ji. Um, Professor Gurubdesh is asking, do tell us more about what happened to Udham Singh after the murder, after this firing. So Udham Singh goes through um, 
an extraordinary time after the murder that when the police so first of all he tries to run he tries to make a run for it straight after he's fired all of these shots the place is in pandemonium and he tries to make it to the door this very large woman called bertha herring who is um who has had her eye on him throughout this this talk that has gone on manages to body check him into a wall and he falls and he crumples to the ground and people jump on top of him. And as soon as it is clear that he's not gonna get away, he offers no resistance at all. He just lies there until the police come. And when the police come, he makes no denial. He says, it is there, it is done. Um, he's taken to a side room and he's uh, babysat by a police constable. And this is, again, this is the dark arts of how this story has been um, tangled up by the British so that for many, many years, there was an alternate uh, uh, story that came out. But at this time with this, this police officer, he is very, very clear that he meant to do what he did. He wants to know how many he killed. When he knows that it's only one, he says only one. He's shocked because he fired and he fired true and he doesn't understand that actually it was a, a gun malfunction that happened. Uh, but by the time he gets to the police station, he tells a different story. And the story is that, oh, I didn't mean to kill anybody. I meant to fire into the roof. I wasn't really doing it. Now, you can take that at face value. But I, all I would say to you is that when I looked at the police constable's records, some of these things are written in contemporaneous writing. So you can see the scribble. I went through his notebook myself. The second part, when he recounts what he said at the police station, is written very, very neatly and clearly has been written a long time afterwards, with thought, perhaps direction. So this start of the narrative that this man is a lunatic, he was a lone wolf, he didn't mean to do it, it starts percolating there. It is also possible that Udham Singh wanted to sow confusion in these times also, because in his possession, there were newspaper cuttings. When I went through the uh, inventory of what was found by the police in his flat in Mornington Crescent, there are cuttings about Indians who have committed crimes and got away with it. So there are, there was a cutting about two women who uh, fired on a Raj official and um, th their confusion, the, the sowing of confusion, they didn't mean to do it, it was an accident, the gun went off, he almost uses verbatim. There's another case of a woman who is tried for shooting at her, her husband and two police officers and he uses that defence. So he makes this kitchery defence which causes confusion, which perhaps is sensible for somebody who wants to string out a trial. Because if you cause enough, enough confusion, if you, if you sow enough doubt all over the place, you might just hang on in prison long enough for the Germans to win the war. Because at this time, remember it's 1940, things could go either way. So he's taken to prison, he's taken to Brixton prison first of all, where he goes on hunger strike. He tries to kill himself because it becomes clear they're not gonna let him go and he's not gonna get this lengthy stay in prison. So he tries to kill himself. He writes letters to covert addresses, which are intercepted. He doesn't know this, but they know that people are trying to smuggle poison or blades into the, into the prison. Uh, all of these things are intercepted. Udham doesn't know that people are sending him the things that he's asking for because he doesn't get them. So he just feels alone, abandoned and alone. So he tries to kill himself. The last thing that he wants is for the British to have the pleasure, shall we say, of hanging him. So he tries to take his own life. He stops eating. They force feed him. And the act of force feeding is appalling in itself. Um, we talk about waterboarding at Guantanamo now, but this was pretty much the same thing. People pin you down. They put pipes up your nose or down your throat till you gag and they fill you with liquid. If you vomit, you may choke on it, uh, but they try and keep you alive that way. And he goes through that. His weight fluctuates madly as a result. He becomes emaciated, then he later starts eating, he puts on weight. As a result of all of this, at the time of his hanging, the people, the hangmen who were meant to do this cleanly and kindly botch the hanging. And this was stuff that has never ever been seen by anybody before. I remember opening it in the archives and yelping because I thought this is, this is never seen the light of day. It was released in 2016, a document about the executioner that he did such a bad job that the vertebrae did not sever cleanly that this is a man who would have suffered at the end of a rope. And this executioner never worked again.
never worked again in this prison. So, you know, this is, this is how he met his end. He was thrown into a, a pauper's grave at the back of the prison. It's an unmarked grave. So he was in between two murderers and he was forgotten about until the 1970s when um, India demanded his remains back. And for reasons which to this day, I still don't understand, they granted that request. And the rest, I hope you know, but I've got some um, records from the newspapers at the time, he went home to a hero's welcome. They had no idea that he still meant so much to Punjab and uh, his remains toured Punjab for weeks. Mm. Yeah. So lots of questions coming up here. Um, there's Major General Hemant uh, Kumar Singh, who's saying, uh, um, when did Udham actually become famous in India? And did Nehru condemn the assault? So Nehru absolutely condemned the assault. Gandhi also uh, condemned the assault within hours of it happening. Um, and you have to understand why they did that, because they, it, to them, he was a problem. He was difficult. He was doing exactly what they were telling the British would not happen. So they were busy trying to tell the British that, look, let us govern ourselves. We are not bloodthirsty animals. We are not people who don't believe in the rule of law. You can leave us to do this and we will part as friends. We're not violent insurrectionists. It can be done cleanly. And then this happens uh, and they immediately wash their hands of him. Gandhi says some really pretty harsh things about Udham Singh. But the, Congress, the Youth Congress wing in Punjab flies against the leadership and says they will not repudiate what he has done. In fact, they want to give him a, a standing ovation for what he did because Jalia Malabar burns deeply within them as, as, as a wrong that needed to be righted and that this has now happened, he has now done this. Uh, in London, uh, Krishna Menon, who was sort of Nehru's ambassador to unofficial ambassador to London uh, is also horrified by what has happened. And, and immediately after the massacre, um, he condemns Udham Singh and uh, says this is a monstrous act, this phrase monstrous act that is flying around at the time. Uh, but then when it becomes clear that he doesn't carry the, the, <coughs> the sentiment of the Indians who live in Britain, because the Indians who live in Britain sign uh, at, at much risk to themselves, sign petitions asking for clemency for them, saying, please don't hang him, do not hang him. And they sign their names and addresses, knowing that actually, that actually will put them under surveillance as well. They still do it. And Krishna Menon then realizes, actually, this is going to go to trial. This is going to be a big trial. And if I'm going to be of any use, I'd rather be in than out. So he inveigles his way into Udham's defense. Uh, did he do a good job? Did he mean to do a good job? Well, all I would say is he doesn't speak once during the trial. Krishna Menon says not one word during the trial. So I'll leave it to you to draw your conclusions. He was inconvenient. He was a very inconvenient moment uh, for uh, the Congress party at the time. Guru Shamshir is asking one, a question that's going to be another conversation or another talk. Uh, how did his trial go? prison life, statements in court, and sentence award. Well, that, 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 is a, that is a whole other talk, but I will uh, just say to you that all of that is, is, is in, in, in the book. <laughs> you know, this kind yeah. of kitcheny defense, it's complicated and it's involved and it's uh, to some people rather baffling. Uh, the why does he say one thing in this statement at the police station and another thing when he's there and another thing when he's in trial. He, I think the most important record that I found uh, was when um, he was speaking to a prison guard. And again, this is, you, you know which are the important statements because they are the ones that most pain has been taken to bury them. So there is one statement that he makes to a prison guard saying, Sir Michael would have been his anniversary today, you know, when he's in prison saying, this is the day would have been his anniversary. Isn't it good that he's gone? He, you know, I paid him a visit. So those are the things that I think carry the most weight. And then just Veer Kaur is asking, was Udham Singh married? Actually, I want to know his personal and prison life. I think that um, also we should tell everybody that we have a new edition coming out and everybody is urged to place an order and to buy. So 
in um, his confession, when he's arrested in 1927 for this gun running and the confession is, and, and you know the way in which police interrogations went in those days, they weren't asked with velvet gloves. Uh, he talks about being married and he talks about being married to a Mexican woman and having two children by her. Now that, that to me just set my nerves jangling like we've got to find her. Uh, and there, this is the woman, Lupe, who I found in the records, who sort of matches his description of where she came from and also the place where he's desperate to send letters and money after he dies. So he writes a number of letters in prison about two mysterious sources that ha are, are clearly um, fronts for other people to say, actually, I have a car. He becomes desperate about this car that he supposedly left in, in Riga, which is code for something else, which is money, which he wants to be given to this woman in California. Uh, so that, that is as close as we can get to, to standing that story up. Um, do I know it for sure? No, but he certainly talks about it in his confession. Um, Kamlesh Mohan has her hand up. Uh, Arindaji, uh, maybe Kamlesh, you would just, is it a comment or a question, but if we can quickly have it and then I think we, close with that question and let Gurpita come on. I mean, well, I have, a, I have two questions. Hmm. Uh, one question is, that is, how does Udham Singh figure in the collective memory? And the second is, that is uh, uh, issue of means, violence and non-violence. How did Udham Singh look at it? Because Bhagat Singh has talked about it that we should reinforce nonviolence with violence if necessary. How do you look at it? So uh, the first part of that, what was the first part? What was the first thing that you asked me about? Um, uh, the first is the collective memory of Indians. Okay, okay. so the collect, I can, you, you're better placed to talk about the collective memory of Indians. I can tell you here in Britain, nobody knew his name, nobody knew who he was, but if it is of any uh, use to you, Nobody knew the names Michael O'Dwyer or Reginald Dyer either. This is such a difficult period in history for Britain to reconcile itself with that it has deleted the memory of all of these people. Um, when, when I was talking about the book when I was touring and it was really very, very well received here in, in Britain, um, two things happened. First of all, I had people who came to book signings and asked to embrace me, <laughs> like, you know, and to say, sorry, sorry that we did this. Uh, in Ireland in particular, uh, I had letters, uh, piles of letters coming from people in Ireland saying, please forgive us. We had no idea this was one of ours who did this to you and we can't believe it. Um, the second part is uh, on his relationship with violence. But Singh was a violent man. He was a violent man. You talk about Bhagat Singh, Bhagat Singh, and it's weird because I know the, the pieces that you're talking about by Bhagat Singh's pen. He, he met Bhagat Singh, Bhag, Bhagat Singh in prison and he talked about Bhagat Singh being his God. The meeting with Bhagat Singh was so pivotal to him that after it, he was quite a religious man up to that point. And then when he meets Bhagat Singh, he becomes an atheist. And he, he starts saying, actually, I, there is no God. You have to do things by your own hand. But there are incidents, again, in the book where I've got a sort of firsthand testimony from people who lived in this country of how he traveled with a gun, how at one point he's driving down a road with his friend, this other sort of adopted son. He, everywhere he goes, he kind of adopts people. And then as soon as they start loving him, he kind of dumps them. But this, this young man who is in his thrall, they're driving up a lane and he, they see a policeman on a bicycle and they say, huh? Do you want to kill this Ferengi? And the friend is like really shocked. Like, what are you talking about? Doesn't even know he has a gun. He goes, just for fun, do you want to? And then he sees the look on his face and he says, I'm just kidding. We don't kill cats and dogs. We kill more important people. This is before the assassination. So he is a, he is a man who believes in violent means and also violent retribution for violence because he talks a lot about what happened in India under the, the Raj, right to his dying breath, in fact, about the ignominy and uh, the, the terrible things that were done to his people. Um, I know that you said that was the last one, but I just share one very quick story with you. After I wrote the book, somebody gave me, passed me the um, telephone number for Rex Dyer's granddaughter. I said, do you want to talk to her? And I said, no, I really don't, not until I finish the book, because if I like her, it's going to change the way I write about this. And if I don't like her, it's going to change the way I write about this. 
but finally I did after I handed in the manuscript and I rang her and I said, look, um, my name's Anita Arnold and I, I, people know me here. She said, oh yes, yes, I know you from the BBC. I said, that's not why I'm ringing. Your grandfather wanted to kill my grandfather. Shall we have a cup of tea? <laughs> and <laughs> very British thing to do. <laughs> and the very, very equally British thing to do was when she said, yes, I'd love to. So <laughs> she, she came to my home and uh, we had tea and cake and I thought it would be a really healing thing for me because I'd gone through so much uh, violent violence in the in the research even of this book that I just somehow wanted it I wanted to resolve it somehow and it might have been resolved I thought maybe if she said look I'm really sorry about all of this but she wasn't sorry she said he did the right thing she said that if she were in his shoes she would do the same thing she said that uh, he was a man doing his duty she also wouldn't accept the things that now are accepted as fact, not just from the Indian side and from the minority report, but from British investigations at the time. But she said they were armed. They were charging at Dyer in Jallianwala Bagh. They were, you know, they were, they were going to kill him if he didn't open fire. And I said, I can show you all of this is not true. So, you know, at the end of it, and I, at the end of it, I said, how are you so sure when he wasn't sure? And I'd read her all these accounts of, you know, the, even the young baby who was killed in, in the garden. And, uh, and she just wouldn't hear it. And then I, I read her this thing from Dyer. It's, a, it's from a, a memoir by a, a, a real Anglophile called Kripalani, who was in, in London, who was in the Oxford Union. He was talking about the massacre and he was saying, this man is a bastard. He needs to be punished. He should be hanged, talking about Dyer. And a, and a, and a, a pale faced creature comes over and says, are you talking about Rex Dyer? And he said, yes, I am. And then goes on and he says, I am that unfortunate man and hobbles off. And then we know what happened to Dyer at the end of his life, that he never spoke of it and that he died a broken man. I said, and I looked up from, from reading this piece from Kripalani and she was crying, she was crying. And I felt terrible. I said, why are you crying? Why are you crying? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to make you cry. And then I got really angry. I said, why are you crying now? You didn't cry for any of the things that I told you. Why are you crying now? And she said this one thing. She said, because he's family. And I, I understood. I got it. <laughs> I got it. I didn't like it, but I got it. He's family. So there we are. Just I thought you might be interested in that little story. No, it is like, extremely interesting. And I mean, it almost feels like we're all sitting around you and listening to this. It's like this fantastic, fantastic story. Except, of course, it's all real. And um, yeah, thank you for sharing it with us today, Anita. It was really, really wonderful. And I'm really grateful to you. Um, I'm going to ask Gurpratap to please come on now. I'm already on. Okay. Jay. Thank you so much, uh, Anita. That was really, really wonderful. And the whole thing, using your photographs, your memorabilia, it was simply wonderful. And it all brought uh, in touch with that life that we don't really know. You know, I would like to uh, begin the conclusion by quoting uh, one of my favorite poets, T.S. Eliot, because he once wrote, April is the cruelest month, reading lilacs out of dead ground, mixing memory and desire, stirring dull gifts with spring rain. It's April now, and it's Vesakhi today, and our memory today has been stirred by you and your what happened way back in 1919 is still remembered by all Punjabis and tributes are paid to the martyrs all over the world. Today, we at Maja House, thanks to you, also paid our humble tribute to everyone's hero, Udham Singh. On behalf of Maja House and all the audience, I thank you, Nita, for this wonderful, wonderful session. It was enlightening and very informative and the way you brought his life and his one singular abiding aim in life to light was simply brilliant. Thank you so very much for joining us today and sharing all this with us. It's simply wonderful. Even your own personal anecdotes and incidents that you shared, which may Thank not, very much. but they are simply wonderful to hear. It's very, very kind of you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. And one last question. Did you feel like killing that Firangi? <laughs> 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 I'm, I, I'm, I'm actually a woman of peace, so I was, you know, very, <laughs> not anything I've ever been tempted to do, never. <laughs> you know, poison tea is also a very British thing. Pardon? What's that? I said the poison tea is also a very British thing. Yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> yes, indeed. 
Thank you so much, Anita. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. And also, let's let's just also remember the farmers because they must be celebrating yeah. some form of Vaisakhi sitting where they are sitting. Let's not also forget that it is a harvest festival as well, and you know what's happening. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye, Anita. Thank you. मोटर चला लेनी थी तुम तो कह रही थी मैं जल्दी आऊंगी भूल गई फिर हां कहां चली गई 